I'd like to uh, introduce this workshop. It's an introduction to spatial audio with Anastasia Devana from Magic Leap. Some of the takeaways from the workshop is that creatives will, and technologists will better understand some of the technical workflows for engine-based XR experiences, and you'll learn something about spatial audio. Anastasia Devana is the audio director of the Sonic Arts team for Magic Leap, a South Florida tech startup that recently released its first spatial computing system, Magic Leap One. With a dual background in software development and music composition, she and her team use technology to push the boundaries of what's possible with sound and to advance the role of quality of audio in this new medium. Anastasia is an advocate for the importance of audio and innovative systems in this new reality and this new frontier. Um. My name is uh, Anastasia Divana, uh, and I'm still trying to figure out kind of how to best explain what it is that I do. As you see here, it says spatial audio and something XR developer. Uh, so up until recently, I was the audio director at Magic Leap, and uh, my team was in charge of creating and implementing all audio content for first par party Magic Leap experiences. So this includes um, audio UX, for the actual Magic Leap One device and operating system, it includes Create, Undersea, Pancake Pals, uh, The Last Light, Magic Kit. Uh, I also worked on numerous prototypes and internal demos, including the early prototypes of Tenendi. Uh, I helped with Seven Ages of Man experience with the Royal Shakespeare Theater. Um, and I talked uh, about spatial audio to a number of partners and content developers. Uh, so I was at Magic Leap for five years and definitely got to learn a lot about this new medium of spatial computing. Uh, and before that, I have done freelance work in VR. And even before that, I had two other separate careers. Uh, one is a music composer for film and TV, and another one is a software engineer for large-scale online platforms. Well, they were considered large-scale large back, back in that time. Uh, but what I enjoy most now um, is actually combining my sort of creative, you know, musical and technical backgrounds uh, and working in this new medium uh, in XR and, you know, push the boundaries of what is possible with audio. So I have recently started my own company uh, called Here XR and don't try to find it just yet. I'm still working on a website um, and I'm working on various XR projects, either as a developer or as audio director or both. Uh, I also consult content developers hardware, software manufacturers on kind of the lay of the land and spatial audio. Uh, and the image that you see there uh, is kind of my humble beginnings with uh, VR or XR uh, and kind of symbolizes really the plight of, of the sound designer. Because as you can see, uh, when I bought my first sort of fancy cardboard type um, phone holder, it actually did not have an audio jack. So I had to drill a hole in order to plug in my headphones. This is going to be a recurring theme here. All right, so moving on. Uh, so a couple of quick PSAs. Uh, I was going to do some examples because I was hoping that Zoom would cooperate and um, play uh, stereo uh, audio over Zoom. I think it still might work. Uh, if you are connected on Zoom, but it might not. So um, I will not be showing too many examples right now during this presentation, uh, but I will point you to a couple of videos that I would still like you to, to find on YouTube and watch. And for those, you do need to wear headphones. So if you have a pair, please grab them, put them on. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll uh, follow up with the organizers and share some resources um, you know, later on for some follow-up videos that you could watch with some example of spatial audio. Um, and another thing that I would ask is I will kind of ask you like, hey, please watch this video for one minute <laughs> and then please come back to the presentation because you'll get distracted with cat videos and stuff. Um, and another request that I will try to make it fun and engagement, um, but you know, it's, it's kind of hard to do that without audience feedback. So if you are online, you know, in a chat, Please give me some kind of uh, anything, emojis, agreement, disagreement, smiley face, uh, something that I know that you're there. All right, and that will be just less painful for everyone. 
All right, so as you can see, the title of presentation is called Something About Spatial Audio, The Rant. Um, and you're wondering what, what does that even mean and why is there a little asterisk there? What's that for? So there's a story there. So I agreed to do this talk about a month ago and then I kind of got busy on a project. Uh, but in the meantime, one of the organizers, Diliana, is emailing me and asking me, hey, can you please send me your, your bio and your, your photo and like a title and abstract? And I was terrible and completely dropped the ball on that. So she was like super wonderful and put this stuff together for me, <laughs> like found it online and put together the title and abstract. Uh, but then she was like, hey, like your feedback would be really great on this. And I shamefully uh, failed to respond to that again. So early this week, I finally, you know, made some time because I'm like, okay, I need to prepare for this and let me see what this is all about. Um, so I went to the event page and this is what I see. It's a series of talks, rants, and panels on XR in 2020. And I was like, ooh, rants, interesting. I've never done a rant before. That might be fun. Uh, and then I was like, okay, well, what is my talk supposed to be about? And here are the takeaways listed on my talk description. Specifically, I'm referring to this, something about spatial audio. And I honestly kind of love that uh, for two reasons, because first, it is true. I hope you will learn something about spatial audio from this talk. And then the second reason I will, I will mention later in this presentation. Uh, so this is what the story behind the title. Uh, but I'm not going to rant too much, maybe just a little bit. Instead, I'll, this is kind of what I'm going to cover. Uh, so uh, I'll talk about, you know, general overview of what is spatial audio, uh, what is its importance in XR, uh, what are the different techniques of making spatial audio and some best practices. Okay, so we'll start with what is spatial audio. And the answer to that question is complicated because nobody can agree on what it is. Uh, I don't really have a good definition to give you, but I went online and I typed in what is spatial audio. So uh, I came up with some interesting takes. Uh, the first one is spatial audio is designed to deliver surround sound and 3D audio via your headphones. Uh, so the problem with this one is that it doesn't need to be delivered over headphones and it's just kind of a mishmash of terms here. So I'm going to go with the no on this one. Uh, the next one is in general, the term spatial audio is used to broadly mean audio that is not mono. Uh, and that's from NPR and I, you know, I'm a supporter, um, but this ain't it <laughs> NPR. This is, you know, a little too broad. I think to, to try to define it. Uh, another take from PC Mag is that it's audio amplification and speaker technologies that reproduce the spaciousness of sound. That doesn't really even mean anything. So, so that's a pass. Uh, BBC has a pretty good one. Uh, spatial audio is a way of creating sound in 360 degrees around the listener. Sound can come from any place in the sphere. That that's a, pretty good description kind of that I'm, I'm on board with. And this is my favorite from Abbey Rhodes. Spatial audio is any audio which gives you a sense of space beyond conventional stereo, allowing the user to pinpoint where sound is coming from, whether this is above, below, or a full 360 degrees around you. So that is my favorite of the bunch. All right, so now we're going to play a game called Is This Spatial Audio? And, um, you know, you can count your points, how many you guess correctly. It's an easy game. They all go in order. Okay. So positional, I mean, I'm going to go with yes. Um, people just sometimes refer to spatial audio as positional, just meaning that sounds have a defined position in space. Binaural. Yes, uh, when you listen to binaural audio, it does appear that sounds are coming from different points in space. Binauralized um, is slightly different than binaural. You could say that binaural is audio that was recorded binaurally and it just getting played back in that way. Binauralized is audio that was recorded in different ways and then manipulated, but then the final sort of delivery to the listener is in, in a binaural format and binaural just meaning like referring to two ears, right? It comes through you through two ears. Um, 360, 
I mean, yeah, it's sure. It's all kind of <laughs> the same, honestly, positional, 360, spatial. Uh, ambisonic, yes, that is a format, audio format that basically describes the entire sphere of audio. Uh, object base, yes, that's a different format that instead of describing a sphere, it describes the sounds itself and their positions in space using metadata. Uh, HRTF, yes. So HRTF is actually a technology that takes ambisonic or object-based audio format and binauralizes it um, and then delivers it to the user to make it appear spatial. All right, in the A column, we have, oh, sorry, miss, missed one, multi-speaker arrays. Uh, that's another way of delivering spatial audio. So instead of putting it in your ears through two channels, headphones, uh, it can be mapped sort of in a giant uh, speaker dome. All right, so on the A side, we have mono. No, just right down the middle, exactly how you're hearing my voice right now, probably. Uh, and then stereo. That's just left and right. There is no front, back, up, down. Sometimes kind of, these are like confusing terms. So immersive mm, doesn't really, well, it means a lot. It means some, it means everything to everyone, right? So it can be immersive. Sometimes it's referred to as immersive. Uh, surround is kind of a no. Um, 5.1, for example, doesn't have up, down positioning, uh, but su surround is also like a pretty flexible term you can have many, many channels and surround, and then it sort of becomes a multi-speaker array. Uh, 3D, so I like to call spatial audio 3D, and I would put it in the yes category, except that the audio engines kind of messed it up for us, uh, because if you go to Unity or Unreal, and you see something called 3D audio, that's a lie. <laughs> that is actually just stereo audio. And then the sounds also get quieter as they get further, but there's no front, back, up, down. So I get a lot of the, oh, I just used the 3D audio, you know, in, in Unity and it's great. I'm like, no, no, that's not 3D. So uh, that's unfortunate. Okay, 80. Um, so AD. Well, okay, so eight doesn't really mean anything. It's just a number. Um, if you go to YouTube, they have now 16D and 24 and 32, 100D, I even 200D yesterday. I was just, I'm like, no, you guys are just grabbing random numbers and putting D afterwards. Um, but it is kind of sort of spatial because what it is is actually an example of binauralized audio. Uh, so when you listen to it, yes, the sound is coming from different points in space. It just, I think just the title is ridiculous. All right, so what does this sound like? So this is the part where uh, hopefully you can go and look up a couple of videos that I give you. And I will also, hmm, do I play them over this? No, I don't, I don't think I'm gonna play it over. Um, well, let me just mute that. Uh, I'm not gonna play this over Zoom. So um, let's do this. Let's let's go to YouTube and find those videos. All right. So the first one um, is really the most famous example of a binaural audio recording. Uh, so if you go to YouTube and just search for virtual barbershop, that should be the first video that comes up uh, and it will look, you know, it will have this the, the title screen that looks like that. Um, so let's listen to that and let's listen until about uh, three minutes and 18 seconds. So that's right after the barber finishes using the electric razor.
right, hopefully you're back with us. Um, and if you've never heard spatial audio before, that's kind of what it sounds like. Um, people usually think it's pretty cool when they hear it for the first time. I've heard it so many times. Um, anyway, so the next one is AD Audio, everybody's favorite. Uh, so you can go to YouTube and look up Imagine Dragons Believer AD, uh, which has 53 million views. Um, and let's listen for about one minute. Uh, it's really kind of all the same after that. All right, so welcome back. So how does spatial audio work? How can the sound be coming from the headphones that are on the ears, like the speakers are located here, uh, but it seems to us like it's coming from somewhere else? Well, here's a little bit of science. So the process of um, a, a creature, <laughs> figuring out where the sound is coming from is called localization. And the way localization works in humans, um, it is affected by a couple of different things. So you will probably see these terms or hear these terms mentioned, um, something called ITD and ILD. So one is the inter, oh my gosh, interoral time difference and interoral level difference. So time difference, meaning that um, the sound, you know, coming from one side of my head will arrive to my right ear a little bit faster than to my left ear. That's the time difference. And level difference is that it will be slightly louder in my right ear than in my left ear. The other way we um, can localize sounds is uh, by making very small movements with our head. Uh, because if you, if you think about the math, um, and the sound is like directly in front of us uh, or directly behind us, the interaural uh, time and level difference would actually be the same. So we can't tell where the sound is coming from. And there are some tricks you can play on your friends uh, to, to prove that. Uh, but in, in life, people make kind of micro movements with the head. So as we turn our head, then this ITD and ILD kick in and our brain can figure out like, okay, that sound is in the front or behind. Uh, the other thing that happens is that our ear has a specific shape that is unique to every person. Uh, and as a sound is coming from, for example, from behind, it doesn't directly get into the ear canal. It has, it has to pass around or through the pinna, the actual ear. Um, and that gets, that sound gets affected, right? So that's why the sounds behind us sound different than in front. Uh, our body and head, shoulders also act as a kind of filter because sound can bounce from your shoulder and go into your ear. And all of that kind of informs our brain as to, as to location of the sound. And the, the key thing to, to know here is this term, HRTF, which stands for Head Related Transfer Function. Uh, and it's currently the most widely used algorithm for processing sound in a way that when delivered over to channels, like these headphones, uh, the sounds seem that they're coming from other points in space. So basically what they did is they took all this math and science of localization and sort of baked it into HRTF. And typically HRTFs are kind of measured and recorded as opposed to like 
redoing all this math in real time. Um, okay. All right, so I kind of explained what spatial audio is and kind of how it works. Um, so let's talk about why, why it's important for this medium. All right, so here are some reasons. So first reason, it sound plays a functional role. Uh, it can go where visuals cannot. So, you know, in the world of headsets and wearable devices, everybody talks about field of view and how it's never big enough, needs to be bigger. Uh, but if you think about a human beings field of view, it's actually not that great. It's fairly limited as you can see in this picture. So overall we have about 120 ish um, degrees field of view, but as you can see, it's, it's totally not good on the sides. Uh, it's not very precise at all. Now, if you think about hearing, on the other hand, it has no such limitation. We can actually perceive and hear sounds uh, coming from every direction around us. Uh, sound can also travel down hallways, go around objects, uh, even pass through walls, and light cannot. Um, objects don't actually disappear uh, entirely from our reality if we can't see them. Uh, so. So we can actually continue hearing them uh, and we can, with a certain degree of accuracy, actually tell where that sound is coming from. So if you're trying to put this virtual object into the person's space, um, you absolutely need to use spatial audio in order, to, in, in order for it to have presence. Uh, there are some other advantages that hearing has over, over sight. Uh, it has better temporal resolution. So we can, uh, for example, tell the difference between two clicks of sound uh, down to like tens of microseconds accuracy, um, where for light is about two hundredths of a second. Um, and also our initial like perception of sound is actually faster, uh, four to eight times faster than of uh, visuals. And that kind of makes sense because um, we believe that evolutionary role of hearing was to alert us to dangers or sudden changes in stimuli that happen outside of our field of view. So, you know, if you hear a tiger, you know, you, you run now and ask questions later. So actually our reaction time to sound stimuli is also faster than to visuals. All right, the other reason why uh, sound is important for this medium is because Oh, I lost my arm. <laughs> sound makes it real. <laughs> so in the immortal words of Spoon Boy, there is no spoon. And that's why I'm showing you a fork. Or is it a knife? You know, how can you tell? How can you tell what's real, right? And not, not in a philosophical sense, but like literally, how can you tell the things that are real? Like this magical disappearing <laughs> water bottle you know, how do you know that it's real? <laughs> it's not because it's disappearing. Um, but you know, you've seen enough water bottles in your life, right? That you, you know that this is probably a water bottle. Uh, so I, I don't know if there's like an exact, you know, science to this, but I like to think of our brains as kind of little computers. Uh, so we have inputs, like sensory inputs, right? The sight, hearing, um, taste, smell, touch, those are five major ones. And we collect data throughout our life uh, from these inputs. And then we, we build these models, right? Um, like we, you all have a model of what a water bottle is. That's why you could tell that what I was holding was a water bottle, even though you've never seen one like that. Um, so if the input, what you're seeing, for example, matches your expectations of what a water bottle looks like, you're like, Okay, it's real probably. Looks pretty pretty legit. Um, but what if I, you know, dropped this water bottle and it made no sound? Or what if it made a completely wrong sound? You know, like a pile of bricks. Um, then you would start doubting, right? There's a fake, fake water bottle. Um, so when you're creating, you know, this virtual content, just having fantastic, amazing visuals uh, is not going to cut it, right? You need to have sound that actually matches that. Um, so basically, the more sensory inputs that are conforming to our model, to our expectations of this object, the less reason we have to doubt um, that it's real, right? So the more the merrier. 
And the last, well, not last, but the third reason why audio is so important is that it does what it's always done in our in other mediums, right? It tells a story. Um, it can communicate information. It can communicate context, uh, time and place. It can provide feedback to the user. Um, it also can improve attention and information retention and reaction time and memorization of material. But it also can create emotion. Uh, it can make your your viewer, um, your user feel something. It can make your experience really compelling and impactful and memorable. Sound has that power. And if you don't believe me, um, don't, don't do it right now, but later on, look up Star Wars minus Williams on YouTube and you'll know what I mean. Um, so in light of this, I would like to share something with you that will help you make better content. Here it is, here it comes. The rant <laughs> that you've been all waiting for. So here's the thing about audio. Audio has, is, and will always be misunderstood. Uh, on a vast majority of projects, it is underscoped, underbudgeted, understaffed. It's actually forgotten about until the last minute. Uh, if you don't believe me, here are some examples. Here's this lovely, very nicely detailed production flowchart that I found online. It kind of outlines in great detail a production flow for a video game, you know, all the way for, from pre-production to post-production. And do you know what's not on here? Uh, I think you know, I think you know what's not on there. I know it's tiny, but just take my word for it. Here's another one, a uh, really nice witty flowchart that helps one identify the role in game development. Um, and this, by the way, had 4.5 thousand likes and 1.4 thousand retweets. And can you guess what's not on here? <laughs> I think you know. Um, so why does this happen? Uh, I don't really know, but I, I actually have a theory. I think because we process sound differently than visuals. Like most people um, do not and cannot think about sound analytically. Uh, we don't even have the right vocabulary to talk about it that we can all agree on. Like if I told you, you know, make me a blue button, blue square button, um, that's pretty easy, right? You can, you know, exactly what I'm talking about. You know, maybe the blue color might be slightly off, but then I can say, hey, make it darker or less saturated. And, you know, we both know what those words mean, even, you know, even if we're both not like graphic designers. But now if I say make a sound effect for this button, there isn't really a common vocabulary to describe um, that would, to describe that, that would be generally understood by everyone and who's not a sound professional. And even for sound professionals, like there's no good vocabulary to, to describe things, right? The best bet for me is usually just make mouth noises and <laughs> I'm pretty terrible at that. So it just doesn't work that well. Uh, so we cannot be rational about sound, right? And I feel like the way we perceive it is just all pure emotion. Um, for example, I watched uh, a YouTube video recently uh, of a Unity developer who was sharing some cool tricks and tips that he, he learned in Unity recently. And he was happy to share that the Unity game play view has a mute button, you know, and his rationale was like, hey, you're playing this game and over and over and you just keep hearing the sounds and this music and sometimes you just want to mute it. Um, but it's curious that there's no like turn off visuals button. Like nobody says like, oh, I, you know, work in this game and I just can't stand looking at these trees anymore. <laughs> Uh, you know, or like the same character just wearing the same shirt every day. Um, or, you know, thinking about placeholders, right? Like we can rationalize that. We can look at the gray cube and understand that this is going to be a character in our experience. Uh, but if, if we had a, an equivalent, an audio equivalent of a gray cube in a game, uh, I would get angry, really angry messages and emails about, can you please turn that off? Um, so I am honestly not bitter about this. I think it's kind of funny, uh, but it's also kind of a good thing because that anger tells me that sound has the power to make people feel things even though they don't understand why and don't realize it. So ideally, you know, we use this power for good and not to annoy people, but it's good to know that it has that power. And now you understand why I thought that 
this was so great. <laughs> Something about spatial audio. Uh, it's perfect. Uh, and this is kind of my, you know, my, my heads up to you. Like this can happen to you too. You too will forget about audio in your project and that's okay. Um, but now that you know better, um, it's probably good that you will think about audio from the start and you will be ahead of others and make better content. So everybody wins. And this concludes my rant. Moving on. All right, techniques. Okay. All right, so how do we start talking about techniques? As you probably know, probably from listening to other talks today or just generally research in this area, everything is very confusing and nobody agrees on anything and there's just too much. Uh, so even when I start talking about formats, there is so many different things that kind of encompass spatial audio that it can get messy. Uh, but I will, tr I will try to sort of clarify it for you and I will focus on the things that are more relevant to actually creating, you know, shippable quote unquote uh, product that can get to end users. So I will talk about formats, uh, capture techniques, authoring techniques, and reproduction techniques. All right, so format. Uh, so you're probably familiar with this. Uh, the experience can be rough, different types of experiences can be roughly divided into three DOF or six DOF and DOF stands for degrees of freedom. So three DOF, uh, you are viewing the content from a specific vantage point and you cannot move closer or further away from anything. And then six degrees of freedom is you can view this content, you can still kind of rotate your head like in three DOF, but you can also move in three degrees of freedom within that content. So in terms of choosing your audio format, this is gonna be the key sort of differentiator of which format you go with. So for three DOF, uh, in general, you would go with something called ambisonic format. Uh, it is also sometimes confusingly called sound field, uh, but it is a channel agnostic audio format, which basically has information about the entire sphere of sound uh, represented from a specific point in space. Uh, so like I said, the limitation of three DOF which matches ambisonic really great is that you cannot, cannot actually move within that sphere. You're just staying in one spot. You can just sort of rotate your head and, and the sound will, you know, stay uh, in one spot relative to your head. So for example, you know, if you're doing a 360 video recording with the 360, uh, 3D video camera, uh, that's a perfect pairing. You would put an ambisonic microphone there and the, the visuals and the sound would be all recorded in the sphere from the same vantage point. All right, in terms of three degrees of freedom, what you want to use for the most part is object-based audio. So like, as I mentioned a little earlier, object-based is you have your sounds and each sound carries some kind of metadata information that describes its position in space and rotation, position and rotation. All right, now on to capture. So again, for three DOF, you know, you use Nambisonics, you would use one of these bad boys. Um, and again, you would use ambisonics um, in a couple of different cases, right? If you first, if you're making a 360 video and you need to capture uh, location sound, right? Uh, if you're capturing a music performance, this, you definitely would want to use one of these ambisonic microphones. Um, and if you want to use maybe some natural sound bed, that's maybe use it in your six off experience, but something that just creates a nice sort of uh, audio skybox around the user. Um, so yeah, this weird looking things are ambisonic microphones. Um, and the ones pictured here range between $600 and $20,000. Um, and you can see that some of them have more capsules than others. So that actually defines the, what is called the, the order of the ambisonic field that it will record. So the minimum is four capsules and that's the first order ambisonic, and then it can go up to you know, unlimited, you can just make the whole bowl full of microphones. Um, but the higher the ambisonic order, the more precise is going to be the spatial resolution. So for the first order, I believe it's about like 15 degrees. So the sound is somewhere within that field, whether for higher orders, it will be, 
the resolution will be more and more narrow. Uh, now for object-based approach, what we want to do, and that's kind of the opposite, right, of, of the ambisonic uh, recording. So for ambisonics, you're representing the entire scene immediately in the sphere. So if you put your microphone there, it will record everything. And I mean everything, right? So that can actually be, you know, a negative if you're not in a good sounding location. And, you know, and that's, that's actually pretty problematic. Um, because you may have like fans going or people walk around and all that stuff. Um, but in any case, so we are recording and capturing this entire sound sphere. Now for six degrees of freedom, we're not capturing the sound sphere. We're actually recreating the sound sphere uh, using algorithms, right? And, and additional processing afterwards. So what you want for your actual source sound is to keep them uh, as dry as, you know, that's an audio term, but basically dry means free of any reverb, uh, any noise. Uh, so ideally, you know, if you have access to one of these guys, uh, that's an anechoic chamber, which has no reflections and no reverb. So as you go in there, the sound just plays once and that, you know, it's totally dead, as we say. Uh, of course, not many people have access to this. Uh, but that would be kind of ideal place to record source sounds. There's of course other software to remove reverb and noise, um, but every modification like that degrades sound quality. So like with cooking, uh, starting with high quality ingredients is key. Now you say, what about those freaky like ear head microphones, right? The binaural or even this um, omnibinaural stuff of nightmares. So. This is actually the one on the left is actually how the barbershop recording was created. Um, the way this works is they put microphones inside the little fake ears uh, and the sound um, is actually perceived from, from a point of like a human's ear canal, right? So it's already, you know, going through the pinna, through the ears and, you know, gets all this ITD and ILD because it's shaped and sized exactly like a human head. Um, so basically you're capturing sound exactly like a person with those kind of ears would, would hear it. Um, now, the, the cool thing about those is it sounds really good. It sounds very accurate uh, for, for most people uh, because like I mentioned, everybody has sort of unique ear shape. Uh, so this is not going to work for people who have uh, unusually shaped or sized ears, right? And that actually goes for algorithms too. But the, the actual like quote unquote immersion of what you get from this recording is much higher than from what we can do with algorithms. The drawback is that you can neither turn your head within this recording nor you can move. Uh, because it was recording within this head, right? It's not representing sounds in space. It just re represents that particular snapshot of that head direction, right? So you can say this is zero DOF. There's no, no three, no six. Um, so it's actually not suitable for XR experiences with the small exception of you can use them for kind of sparingly for special effects. Um, because again, they have that more accurate representation. Like if you wanted to record a really short clip of somebody like whispering behind you in your ear, um, that might be, that might be a, an impactful approach. All right, moving on to authoring. So again, for three DOF, um, it's actually fairly easy, Co you know, relatively speaking. So the whole like three, you know, three DOF, like 360 video content production pipeline kind of comes more from the film, TV, linear media background. So, so the, the production like authoring environment here is much more suitable for your traditional uh, kind of film sound designers who have not worked in games. Um, and the tools kind of are comparable or uh, integrate pretty well with industry standard audio applications. So a sound designer could use something like Facebook 360 spatial workstation that allows you to sort of mix and position sound in space and, you know, relative to this 3D video. 
Um, there's something called Ambisonic Toolkit. Uh, there's Dear Reality, and there, there are more kind of ways to author that. But it's you know it's 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 straightforward for somebody who has done film work. Um, with six stuff, things get a little more tricky if you've never worked in game development. Um, but for game developers, these are more familiar workflows because game development has actually been doing this similar thing for a long time. So there's typically a 3D game engine, something like Unity, Unreal, of course, there's more. These are the more popular ones. Um, optionally, a sound designer might use what's called audio middleware. That's sort of a standalone engine tool that works alongside the game engine. Um, I will say that there's a kind of misconception that this is required for spatial audio. It is not required for spatial audio, uh, but it is really good when you're working on larger scale projects or you don't have a like a coder who wants to create audio tools or you don't have bandwidth to create audio tools and you probably don't um so this can save time and this can like you know give you a better product at the end of the day all right and now finally to reproduction so now regardless of whether you were working on ambisonics so object-based audio now you you know, your sound designer have like authored all this stuff and we have all this like sounds married to this experience. Uh, but for now it's still data uh, and we need to turn them into actual analog sound waves uh, and get them to the user. So how does that work? So you can do a more bespoke approach uh, if you do an allocation based experience or some kind of art artsy installation in a, in a sound dome as is pictured. So that's again, that's a dome full of uh, speakers. So, you know, this, this audio format that you created can be mapped and reproduced through the speakers. Uh, there are also some new technologies that, you know, use beamforming um, to like reproduce this over speakers, but there are definitely some limitations with those. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for that. Um, so, so you have, so, you know, if you don't have a dome, or, or super cool new beamforming thing. You know, on the left here, you have whatever it is that you worked in. Um, you have your product, and on the right, you have the person who wants to hear it. Uh, I mean, you will likely be delivering this, your content over a device of some kind, uh, either headset or a, a handheld device. So how do you get sound from here um, to there, into the user's ear, hole, ear holes? <laughs> Uh, so the, the savior is HRTF, remember that? And HRTF is not the only one, but it's the most popular one um, and most widely available. So you, you would use then a spatial audio plugin. So there are some examples include like Google Resonance, Steam Audio, Magic Leap Sound Field. There are many, many more. Uh, and usually they will work with some combination of um, the things on the left, you know, your uh, your, your development engine and the things on the right, which is your kind of delivery platform. And it's really hard to keep up with what works with what. So, you know, I'm not gonna, not gonna try to like sort it out here, but basically, you know, cho choosing one of those is not, can be a little tricky. Um, but the, again, like something like Google resonance is open source, um, supports many different platforms. Sounds pretty good. So. If you're starting out, maybe that's that's a good start. Um, so basically, the, the sound, this format, either object-based or ambisonic, gets processed by the spatial audio plugin, which binauralizes it and then sends it over to channel output to your user, right? Whether it's over headphones or, you know, if you have a Magic Leap, for example, or HoloLens or um, a Vive Index that has onboard speakers, uh, that are non occluding, but they're still close enough to the person's ear that they still get the binaural effect that can come from the speakers too. All right. So we talked about what is spatial audio, why is important kind of un explain the basics of the techniques and technology behind it. Uh, so I'll go over best practices a little bit. I'll try to do a couple of examples. So we'll see how that works. All right, so something that I refer to as the bread and butter of spatial audio design. So 
basically the the difference uh, practically the difference between spatial audio and non-spatial audio for a sound designer is that before for the most part the sound designer would be dealing mostly with you can say time domain right so aligning sound to picture for example from left to right you know this sound happens here this sound happens there the sound changes over time like so uh, but now we actually introduce in a whole new domain space right so not only sound designer needs to like change their sound in time they also need to design um, how the sound will behave in space through space relative to the listener relative to other things in space uh, and that that gets tricky uh, but here are some kind of best practices that you know we've learned and we've used you know i use them on just about every project and they work uh okay here we go so you have your make every sound spatial some people don't believe that <laughs> uh i do fight me uh, but you know unless you have like super compelling reason not to but i i believe in spatializing every you know every sound including music use multiple sound emitters so what do i mean by that right if you think about the game engine workflow um, a sound emitter is kind of, you know, a little virtual, say, object that is attached to the thing that's supposed to make the sound, right? So that's, that's what goes into your object-based metadata. Like, hey, this sound comes from this point. Um, and when I say multiple sound emitters, I mean more than one sound emitter per object or per character. For example, think about creating a, a large dinosaur, right? If you just put one sound emitter on it somewhere in the middle of its body uh, that emits, you know, the roar and the footsteps and the fire breathing um, and you get close to it in a six degree of freedom experience, that would be pretty weird because you can tell that all that stuff is coming from his belly and that is not right. Uh, so what you would want to do is have individual sound emitters for every part of the dinosaur that would make a sound, right? So the roar coming from the mouth, footsteps coming from each foot, you know, and you can get really crazy with this. And we have in the past, and it sounds really great. Uh, you know, start just adding sound emitters to everything that moves and that can potentially make a sound. Um, it works really well. You know, then you have to, of course, uh, be aware of performance because can't can't do that forever. All right, tune distance attenuation. Um, so distance attenuation is basically uh, you can think of it as a as a curve, as a definition of how uh, the volume of sound gets quieter over distance. So if you're close to something, it's loud, and if you're far away from something, it's quiet. Right? That makes sense. Um, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to have the same sort of distance attenuation curve for every single sound in your experience, because some sounds, you know, are heard from really far away and other sounds you can only hear when you're up close. And it's actually not even has, it doesn't have as much to do with the actual volume of the sound, but with the object that produces sound, because the, the larger the object, um, the further the sound will spread in, in very like simplifying terms. Um, and also it depends on the frequency of the sound, right? Uh, lower frequencies will travel much further than higher frequencies. So what you or sound designer, you know, needs to do is actually go and tweak, you know, this curve for every sound uh, that, you know, to the point that like makes sounds and sounds appropriate. For example, you know, you could have a, a truck engine that has like a long fall off curve. And you can have a little B that has a really short, you know, relatively speaking, tiny fall off curve. And you can also do that with using multiple sound emitters, right? If you go back to the dinosaur, uh, you know, the footsteps and the roar would be heard from a long distance. But then if you can get really, really close to it, maybe you can hear, you know, the, the claws like scraping on the ground or, or scales rubbing on each other. And you would not hear that from a mile away, right? So that the fall off 
attenuation curve would be different for those. All right, use cone attenuation. Um, so that's another sort of property that some uh, spatial audio plugins provide is not just changing how the sound falls off over distance, but also changing how the sound sort of is heard um, relative to like the angle of the of the of the sound producer sound emitter. So, for example, if you think of me, my voice as a sound emitter, uh, it sounds you know pretty clear and nice if I point into the microphone and it probably sounds not so nice if I point away from a microphone or if I, you know, turn around and you can remove the microphone and it will be true for a real person as well. Uh, but basically what some of these plugins allow you to do is to define sort of how, how that sound behaves, you know, that spread um, of, of the volume. So if, if your spatial audio plugin allows you to do that, definitely worthwhile using that functionality. And then use an audio level of detail. And actually, I, I kind of already covered that, you know, with the distance attenuation. So that's basically just combining sort of multiple sound emitters and tweaking the distance attenuation. And that creates a level of detail, meaning like, okay, you can hear some sounds from a distance. And as you're getting closer, you can hear more and more detail as you would in real life, right? Meets your expectations, um, makes it cooler and better. All right, um, so I will try to play an example. Okay, so this is an example from Project Create, um, and it will show um, it will show some of the techniques that I talked about. So multiple sound emitters, sort of cone attenuation, distance attenuation. Um, it's probably not going to be spatial, but you might actually hear something. We shall find out. If you don't hear it, please let me know in the chat. So yeah, as you pro maybe heard, um, as as the viewer was getting closer to some of these objects, that sound changed, and they could hear more detail. As and as they were looking into the portal um, or circular, <laughs> I forgot what the detail is called, <laughs> but they could hear more detail because of that cone attenuation. All right, moving on. All right, interactivity. So uh, earlier today, I think you heard something about hand interactions. Um, so you probably uh, heard that those are important. Um, now, you can think of interactivity this way. Uh, so in linear medium, media, right, there's no interactivity, um, no interaction at all. You're basically, you know, watching somebody swing a sword. Cool. In video games, you have indirect interaction, right? So you have your controller, you press a button, and your character swings a sword. Also cool. Now in VR, XR, spatial computing, what you ha you have or you can have is direct interaction, right? So you are holding the sword, and you swing in the sword. So if it, the sword doesn't behave the way you expect it to, you know, doesn't meet your expectations. Uh, you're kind of like, this is no good. This doesn't feel satisfying. 
you know, and that's, that is accurate also for audio. Like if you had a laser sword and it wasn't making the right sound, um, that would be a bummer. Just it wouldn't be as fun. So here, here's a, a quick example of what I'm talking about. And uh, we'll, we'll see if, if you hear what I'm hearing. Uh, but recently, Half-Life Alex had an update uh, when they introduced uh, bottled liquid physics and shaders. And it looks amazing and beautiful. And let's listen to what it sounds like. So it seems to me that something is missing here. Um, and, you know, there are two reasons behind this. One, one is hypothetical and, and speculation. It is very possible that they just forgot to tell audio that they were working on this. Um, but the other reason is, is actually, you know, a real reason. Like doing things like that in audio is incredibly hard, pretty much impossible, right? Um, with the tools that we have now. And, and just in case you didn't know what I was talking about and what was missing from the video, I took a quick little video myself and here it is. I mean, obviously what was missing was the cats, right? Okay, uh, let's see. Here's another example of, uh, of some of the work that we did on Create that also uh, shows interactivity. Um, and the way, you know, the way this was achieved is it was uh, quite a bit of implementation work and, and custom code. Um, because like I mentioned, doing highly interactive and responsive audio is incredibly hard because uh, the tools just aren't there um, as of yet. Um, but let's let's listen to how this turned out. And I just realized that I might have not <laughs> unmuted myself before the last video. Uh, but I was just saying that here's another example of interactivity that was, it was pretty hard to achieve um, because of the lack of tools for, you know, for this kind of interactive responsive audio. All right, another thing that I want to sort of bring up um, is something called the immersion continuum. I, I honestly like despise the word immersion because like I said, it just means, you know, anything to anyone and it's all different, but I couldn't actually come up with anything better for this one. Um, so what I'm talking about is if you have some kind of continuum, right, of, of bringing, you know, mixing virtual and real, 
um, kind of on the left side of this continuum would be more uh, quote unquote realistic, right? So um, objects that integrate really well into your space and feel grounded and feel like they're really here. And as you go to the right on this continuum, that's what we can call like immersive, you know, fully immersive. So you are, don't have any reference anymore to your surroundings, to your real surroundings, and you're fully in the virtual world. So I am there. Um, so, you know, spatial computing, for example, it's not really, you know, black and white, right? It's not like, oh, spatial computing is on the left and VR is on the right. Um, there's definitely, you know, a, a slider there. Uh, for example, you know, in a create experience, which, which is basically kind of like a fun, playful sandbox to introduce the first users of Magic Leap, you know, to the medium, what we wanted to do is go very much for the realistic feel, like have the characters feel really, really grounded uh, and basically never take the user outside of their room. Uh, but then with something like um, Undersea, uh, that's a project where you are viewing kind of underwater world and, and vistas and interacting with, with creatures. That's, you know, a lot further on the immersive continuum kind of to the right, um, because it was more of a, you know, cinematic experience, really highly photorealistic, and there's like a beautiful large score and there's underwater ambiences. And it was kind of okay to, to, to push the user more into that immersive realm. So whatever experience that you're working with, that's something that you can keep in mind too, is like how much, you know, how much sound, what kind of sound, you know, how quote unquote realistic or immersive do you want it to be? And of course, like all the way on the right, you would have, you know, full VR, right? Um, another thing that you can keep in mind is, you know, there are like cinematic techniques that are, um, that have, you know, been developed over many years and a lot of them don't work, um, but some of them can be reinvented and can work uh, for, you know, for these mediums. Uh, you know, I, I'm like, have mentioned like meeting expectations multiple times, but it doesn't always mean realism. Like we have things like tropes and tropes are also expectations. You know, one of the more famous one, famous ones is a, a gunshot, right? The gunshot in the movies uh, is what we are, or a lot of people think a gunshot sounds like, but it, it actually doesn't, right? It's a, it's a trope that we get used to, you know, from the movies. And if you hear like a real sounding gunshot in a movie, it might be disappointing, you know, or in a video game when we want the player, you know, to feel powerful with, <laughs> with a gun. Um, so, you know, you can sometimes play around with that, play around with those tropes and those cinematic techniques. Um, to, to, you know, again, to like add sort of cinematic elements or, or fun or engaging elements to experience. Uh, for example, one of the first Magic Kid demos that came out, uh, we did the sound. So we actually used some kind of cinematic techniques for this. Uh, you will see this little, little character, little golem that throws rocks at you and you're supposed to dodge the rocks. And so the experience was called dodge. Um, but, you know, we are showing our spatial audio here and we are also using kind of cinematic sounding like whoosh as this rock passes by your, you know, passes by your head, even though it's a rock about this big. So, with, you know, realistically it would make no sound at all, but that would also not be fun. So let's check that out. that all right Com coming up on the final stretch uh so some bonus pro tips so what do you do with all this uh <laughs> good good question so just some you know if, if you're gonna go on and and make this experience and want to really utilize you know the power of spatial audio and make like really cool awesome content 
Um, here are some here are some points. Uh, so first, have the right team. And what I mean by that, um, spatial audio is hard. <laughs> I mean, I've been doing it for I don't know almost six years, and I still have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> or well, that of course I don't publicize that, uh, but really I don't. Uh, just because there is like so much, right? The technology keeps moving, everything keeps changing. Uh, there's still a lot of stuff to discover. Um, so, so you want somebody, you know, who is first of all going to be willing to experiment, willing to learn and to fail. Uh, also, you know, you might want to have somebody who is a little more technical on your team because, like I was saying, there's not a ton of tools, um, and your sound designer might might have to do some scripting or some implementation, or at the very least, like it is better to have somebody who is technical. Um, you know, and then uh, start in pre-production, right? Don't let audio be an afterthought because if it is, you're just not going to get a good result. Like you will have sounds, but you will miss out on the opportunity, you know, to do something really cool and impactful. So it's not, definitely not a post-production process in XR. And iterate fast, uh, meaning don't you know, wait until the last moment. Don't like listen to uh, and work off like video demos, right? Those are good, you know, maybe once, like say if your sound designer, you know, does like a capture of experience and put some sound to it and you're looking at this video and you're providing feedback and you're going back and forth. Uh, the problem with that is that once you put it on device, it might sound completely different and not work at all and the interactivity won't work and the spatial audio will be all wrong. So it is much better to just start, you know, putting things on device as soon as possible and then iterating. And that's probably kind of like a refrain that you hear about other aspects of production as well. You know, and experiment, because like I said, you know, this is very new. Uh, you know, I gave you some of my best practices, but I'm sure there are cases where those are terrible practices, or maybe there are even better practices. So, you know, because it is still fairly new, you know, now it's a good time to experiment and try things. Um, and with that, you know, go, go forth and make some awesome, cool, magical XR experiences. And that concludes the spatial audio, something about spatial audio, the rant. It's any questions. So Anastasia. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you in the chat. It says, which technological um, innovation most excites you? And also, what do you think about ASMR with VR? Okay. Um, what is the technological inv innovation that most excite me? Hmm. I mean, there are, <laughs> and it's a, it's a kind of a cop out question, but um there are a lot it's it's all very exciting i mean i guess in the nearest um geez i don't know no. i also don't want to promote any one specific company uh but you know apple you know earbuds that's that's coming out with with you know cool stuff that is going to be like head tracking in the earbuds that was you know that's been kind of a challenge with mobile ar because you know people would just watch it on their phone and you know, 99% of the time they wouldn't use any headphones. So it's kind of a waste, you know, trying to do spatial audio, but maybe if more people have, you know, this, um, uh, this uh, AirPods Pro or other headphones start doing the same thing, they have actually head tracking, you know, we might be able to deliver better, more accurate spatial audio over mobile AR. Um, you know, and I also, you know, Facebook recently put out kind of more of a promotional video from their Facebook reality labs. Uh, you know, and that's definitely something that like people who work in the industry have talked about for a while, but basically, you know, augmenting the real audio, right? Because like so far we've been talking about augmented reality with visuals, like adding, you know, 
virtual content, uh, but something that audio can do, it's very possible is actually, you know, augmenting like the real world audio. Like maybe you can remove the sound that bothers you or, you know, what I'm looking forward to is actually being able to beam form on a real conversation. Um, because, I, you know, I am one of those people who has hard times hearing um, in a busy, you know, noisy environment, like a bar, like I have really hard times hearing other, other people talking. But if I had technology that can kind of be informed on that person's voice and make it louder, bring everything down, which is possible and within reach, like that would be cool. And I guess in general, I just like, you know, happy that these other companies, these big companies actually start talking about and promoting and educating, you know, people about spatial audio, you know, companies like Apple and Facebook and, and, and others. Uh, and the second question was ASMR. So ASMR honestly doesn't work on me. Uh, I know other people think this is the most amazing thing ever. So probably for people who it works for, like it would be a really cool experience. It just, I can't, unfortunately can't relate to that because I don't, I don't get the, the whole hair stands up on the back of your neck kind of thing. Um, but no, I mean, I, I think it could be cool. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> 